the eight lightning talks, which is pretty awesome. Um, some pretty exciting ones, some new speakers as well. So uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, so before uh, we kind of get into it, I just want to thank our sponsors. So uh, the Organic Box, uh, huge props to them. They've been really helping out uh, for our pizza. So that's, that's really great. Um, if you want to check them out, they're at theorganicbox.com. Uh, not organicbox.com, but the organic box. Uh, and you get some pretty cool food. Um, Startup Edmonton as well has sponsored us with this awesome space. Uh, so thanks Startup. This is pretty awesome uh, that we get to come here every month. And just a note, um, before I get onto the Pac-Man rule, I'm just gonna go past my slides. Um, if you are interested in sponsoring uh, the Edmonton Python meetup or your company is, uh, please let us know. This is something that uh, helps us have pizza and uh, run uh, cooler events, uh, which we plan on doing at some point in the future. Um, so yeah, please let us know on the Slack or edmontonpie at gmail.com, edmonton.py at gmail.com. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a couple things on uh, our kind of community. Uh, we really like, there's, there's gonna be a couple times where uh, we kind of commingle between us. Um, we like to kind of enforce the Pac-Man rule. Um, so don't kind of close the circle, always invite it for more people uh, to come in and always be inviting. Um, and as well, that kind of falls under uh, the be nice, be respectful, uh, be patient, um, and be curious, right? Should probably get that written down at some point. Um, so today's lineup, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so lightning talks, again, for those of you who are not familiar, it's five minute talks. Uh, I'm gonna be less stringent, um, just because we have uh, a couple of people who didn't show today. Um, so the first talk is gonna be by Oliver, Oliver Wave. Yeah, that's Oliver. Um, he's gonna be doing a talk um, it's called Lambda, so that's gonna be good. Um, if Abid shows up, uh, he's gonna be doing a super awesome talk. I didn't get his title. Um, uh, so the third talk is gonna be done by Eddie, Eddie Wave, yeah. Um, so what is a rapper and how do I make one? Um, I forgot to take the talk colon out, um, so there we go on that. Um, Eugene is going to be doing an awesome talk on socket.io, I think. Um, can you wave? Can you tell us the name of your talk? Uh, visualizing Python using socket.io. Done. That's the name of the talk. I got it beforehand. I just didn't want to write it. Um, so as well, uh, Reader, re sorry, Rita is going to be doing a talk on developing a text-based game engine. So Rita, wave. Awesome. Um, Ken is going to be doing a talk on a brief history of Python. Ken, wave. Awesome. And uh, the great talk. Uh, hopefully, Hamir is uh, coming and will be speaking. Otherwise, that's OK. Um, we're just going to move forward and uh, just do the five talks. Um, this is a really good time as well. We are now looking for speakers for October. Um, and November and beyond. So please, 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 talks really help us kind of put this on uh, and is a great way to get your name out in the community. So just send me a message. Okay. Just a quick question. Are lightning talks done twice a year or do you have a schedule for when they're all um, So in the past, uh, we've done them yearly, bi yearly. Um, we've done them at random intervals. Um, whenever we're like, hey, we haven't done this in a while. Um, so please let us know if this is a format that you really like, uh, because this is a great way to kind of get your speaking jitters out, um, to give a longer talk. Uh, I know that the first time that I actually presented at the Python meetup was a lightning talk. Um, so if you do, please let us know. That's really valuable feedback for us so that we can kind of put something on that you actually like attending, right? Answer your question? Perfect. Um, 
So a couple of other things uh, to kind of take note of um, besides today, today's talks. Uh, so a couple of events, uh, DjangoCon US, that's going to be September uh, 22nd to 27th in San Diego. Uh, you can do a couple things. You can go to the conference and you can go see pandas, which is cute. Uh, I'm not talking about the package. I'm talking about cute pandas because they've got a great zoo, um, which is awesome. Uh, I think that Caleb is going to be there. Caleb, wave. Yeah. He's going to be helping out on a tutorial on Wagtail, which is awesome, I think. Um, I don't know if I let the cat out of the bag too early there, um, which is good. So if you're there, you want to learn a little bit more about Wagtail, um, the faces will be uh, familiar. You can ask Caleb about it. Um, another event uh, that Asha and I are volunteering for, and I think a couple of other, other of us, I'm ugh, just tripping over my, my tongue here. Um, so that's going to be November 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th-ish. Um, that's tentative because we're still confirming uh, the places. Uh, that's going to be in Toronto. There's going to be a few of us going. And if it's your first conference, it's a blast. Um, you get to meet all of the developers out east um, in Toronto, and you just get to meet awesome, fun people. Uh, so highly recommend that you go to the conference. Yes, you have a question. Are you doing like a road trip? Um, I'm not going to drive because I am not a masochist. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to be, I, I think that I might be going. I'm still kind of on the fence. I know that Ash is going to be going, but. I, Ash is on the fence. We're both, we, strong communication, right? Um, so we, uh, we might be kind of going, we're both trying to organize, trying to get, but again, getting our faces out there um, is pretty awesome. And as well, it's a great way to find the job that you want. So just kind of a heads up on that. Carson, what's going on? How do you uh, speak on the Python damage? Um, so, one, this is uh, actually, that was, thank you for that. That's, that's perfect. Um, so I spoke last year, um, and it's a lot of fun. I'd highly recommend doing it. It's a little bit stressful. Um, but the way that you submit, um, you submit it, I don't think it's a paper call link, but you go to uh, pycon.ca, and you can just submit a talk um, to go speak. And Asha will be reviewing it, because she's part of that team. Um, she might not review your talk exactly, but um, and, and yeah. So uh, that's that's kind of the way to do it. Um, so go to pycon.ca and you can kind of submit your talks there. Um, highly recommend doing it, and as well, it gives a little bit more visibility into our little community here, which is pretty awesome. September Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Of this month? It is this month. I just checked it today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you folks aren't familiar with Wagtail, it's a CMS for Django. Yeah. The, sorry. Um, yep, yeah, so um, some news. Uh, Python 3.8 beta 2 is available for testing. I don't know. I don't know what to put in here, so I just kind of put that in. Um, so for those of you who are in the audience that want to hire developers, um, please uh, speak up now. And as well, if there is no people in the crowd, um, there has been in the past. Oh, sorry, did you, did you have? Uh, okay. Um, if you do have jobs in the future, please send it to us, um, either through the Slack or email um, at DG Morris, just so that we can uh, advertise your jobs here and you can get a pickings of some awesome developers here. Uh, so a couple of articles, uh, just to kind of point out. Uh, so the PyCon 2019 videos are out. Go take a look. Uh, the link is here. I'll share it in the Slack. Um, come again, sir? Yeah, a lot of really good ones and a lot of 
that I've kind of taken a look at. Um, how to build a Raspberry Pi and a Python robot, I thought that was cool um, and satisfies my 12-year-old, uh, I want to build a robot. Um, so I thought that that was cool. Uh, for those of you who are interested in how other languages uh, kind of perform and how they're written, uh, rather than just Python, uh, there's one program written in Python, Go, and Rust. And I think it's an image parser, I kind of forget. Um, but it was pretty interesting read. Um, so go take a look at that. Um, I know that there are quite a few um, people who are just starting out with Python, uh, which is totally cool. Um, you might want to check out five common mistakes made by beginner Python programmers. Um, just kind of gotchas to kind of avoid uh, while you're programming, just so that you don't have that. Uh, I've got how to use Python Lambda functions. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually made my Python tip on lambdas and I was just like, wow, I'm, this is <laughs> Lambda City. So if you folks love lambdas, love it, then this is your day. <laughs> Theme of the meetup, just lambda, it's called done. Talks, not lambda talks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, so as well, uh, if you want to take a look at how to make a Twitter bot, um, to tweet about how awesome this meetup is. Just kidding. Um, you can take a look at Python Tweepy, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, for those of us who like to do uh, kind of command line apps, uh, there's how to use a progress bar, bar in Python. Um, so that was kind of cool. Uh, it just kind of takes you through a couple of, uh, I don't know, a couple of examples using different packages. Uh, and the last one is a Hacker Noon link uh, that is our favorite Python resources to learn data science. Found a lot of them that were pretty good, uh, pointing in the right direction. Um, thought it was good. So uh, I'll share this link in the Slack and uh, we'll kind of get that started. All right. Uh, so the Python tip uh, for the uh, Edmonton Pi Lambda meetup. Um, so Lambda functions, how do they work? Uh, so on the top there, I've got a couple of functions uh, written normally. So a squared function that just returns um, your parameter squared. Um, so here I just pass it in, just the regular way that we have our functions defined there. So squared five, five times five is 25. And I've got another function below um, that's get full name. So it just returns uh, your first name and last name in an F string. Um, so for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with that notation, it's just an F string. Uh, it's pretty awesome to kind of take a look at when you uh, have the time. Um, so those are two functions that are kind of one-liners. Uh, and I just want to point out that what you can do is you can write them in one line using lambda. So um, if I write that uh, squared function as a lambda, you pass an x, and then you write colon, and the return value is going to be what's on the right of the colon, um, which is pretty. You what? No, it's, yeah. um, and another one, uh, the lambda there on the right, uh, so uh, on the bottom there, sorry. Um, so the return does the exact same thing as get full name on the first part. Uh, so I think is my, so right over here. Um, so if I do get full name for Mr. McPython face, the output is Mr. McPython face. Um, and as well, for those of you who are JavaScript people um, that talk a lot about uh, immediately invoked function execution, uh, or IIFEs for short, um, you can do that in Python as well, just using the Lambda function like that. Um, so if you're interested in it. Um, as well, just so we can get this all out of the way before we get our talk started, last slide, I promise. Um, so our next meetup is on August 12th. Um, so Eddie's going to be talking about demystifying C Python bytecode. Um, what are those PIC files anyways, which is going to be a really awesome talk. Um, and I'm going to be doing a top topic related to something on Python, 
Um, I was kind of leaning one way, and I kind of want to lean another way, so it's undecided. Um, yeah, so uh, that's all the news. Uh, so we're going to get started with our lightning talks. Uh, I'm just going to time you, uh, for those of you who are doing, I'm going to give you one minute uh, just with this symbol. Um, I'll be sitting right here uh, and jeering you the entire time. Just kidding. Um, and we'll give a little bit of time for questions uh, as uh, some people haven't been or aren't here yet. Um, if you are bringing your computer, again, please be prepared uh, to switch as we have uh, a few talks to get through. Okay? Um, so if I could get you folks in helping me welcome Oliver. Um, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thanks. Alright, uh, so I actually picked that up just to talk about half-life video games. Um, okay, so let me know when you're ready to rock. Pardon? You ready to rock? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, about making mobile games. So, um, yeah, like the last one was type hinting in Python, um, which for me is kind of interesting because it, it is a gateway drug to like other languages um, when you start considering um, more calculated ways of constructing like the input output of you know functions. Um, or, or data structures and their interactions. So um, today, just like really basic um, uh, talk on uh, lambda expressions and then map filter reduce with like criminally simple examples. Um, if these are things that you don't recognize, um, they're kind of more of like an expression-based approach to Python. Um, and they're important to keep in mind if you find that you have um, data sets that you are kind of like, um, like it's, if you feel like you're going through kind of like a swamp of steps, to format your data in a certain way, um, then an expression-based approach um, can sometimes be useful. Um, but uh, of course, uh, as we will see, um, there. Oh my God, uh, these scroll bars. Okay, so yeah, so they're um, they're um, they're kind of like if if you're if you have concerns about like what's Pythonic or non-Pythonic, uh, lambdas are generally um, kind of they're 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 it's it's easier to abuse them. Um, so, in terms of kind of like how we generally iterate through things in, in the most kind of like simple of senses, the top left example, you know, if you want t to collect all of the even numbers in a certain range, um, you would use kind of like in terms of iteration and, and conditional statements, you know, like a, like a for loop, if, etc. Um, and what that turns into when you have, um, uh, especially when you have like a more kind of like complex case or you have multiple conditions that you need to satisfy is this, you know, like staircase of things that just drive you crazy. And so, of course, um, one of the nice ways to solve that problem, and this is probably, uh, maybe I have a feeble mind, but this is like one of my favorite parts of the, of the language is, um, is um, iterator comprehension. So in this case, you have a list comprehension that, you know, you can just construct the entire list. Um, and the difference, the difference that happens between like the loop and, um, and the comprehension is that the loop is going to say that something in your code breaks. The object that you've built um, in the loop is going to be partially constructed, whereas in the comprehension, um, if it fails, you, you do not receive anything. So the only time that you actually get a list back is when the entire um, expression executes across um, the iterator. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, and you also have uh, generators, which is kind of like, um, I don't know if you can see easily, but um, it, it will use uh, like regular uh, brackets. Um, and so this is going to, instead of constructing, say that you have like you know, 100,000 objects. Um, if you build the list out, or you know, in either case, you're going to be holding that all in memory. Um, and especially if you're performing you know, multiple operations on data, um, you are totally wasting resources by like continually reconstructing these massive objects. So um, what the generator will allow you to do um, is to construct basically, um, it's, it's kind of, um, I don't know if you've like worked with like range versus X range, uh, but it basically, it only, it's kind of like an on-demand object that doesn't exist in memory and you just kind of travel through it. Um, so they're not totally equivalent, but like you, you would be able to, uh, I mean, we'll get to this in, in, uh, in a couple of slides, um, but um, the, the way to do it with a Lambda expression, as you saw in Dan's examples, um, would be um, to use, uh, well, I suppose this is kind of like jumping ahead a bit, but um, what we're going to get to is how to use kind of like inline functions um, 
in order to solve problems, uh, which you know might not like the, the examples won't be terribly imaginative. Um, but the idea here is that like you can already see how the the syntax for a lambda function uh, it's harder to read than a comprehension and probably than a loop. And especially if you have complex conditions, it becomes a complete nightmare. Um, but there are cases where um, an inline lambda expression is extremely useful, and you want to be able to like employ that kind of um, not just like that kind of thinking, um, or sorry, not just that kind of a performance tool, but that kind of uh, thinking um, in order to just have conceptual clarity over what you're doing. Because if you kind of rely on like the loop case of like for if this that and kind of like one by one operations on what you're doing, um, I think that can sometimes be an indication that um, you could have like a higher degree of, of abstraction or generalization um, for whatever process you're doing. So here we are, um, starting at square one, uh, just a way to get even numbers with a traditional method. Um, and oh my god, this is going to kill me. Um, so um, like we saw before, you have a list comprehension. And it doesn't just work for lists. It works for really any sort of, um, any sort of uh, iterable. Um, and uh, this is kind of like an extremely boneheaded example of something interesting that you can do where if you have a nested data structure um, that you need to perform operations on, um, of course, those terms would be you know, like a little more uh, shaped in terms of what you're doing to them. But like the, the, the general gist here is you can, you can uh, uh, where's Andrew? I'm going to see him rolling his eyes. OK, so uh, um, you can, like the, the basic, like what I'm trying to show here is just that the, the general syntax um, for constructing like any sort of nested comprehension is, uh, and I mean, this is kind of like um, gimmicky way of explaining it, but it is the term that you want ultimately for the elements in your iterable kind of like prepended to the entire loop. So like the for loop reads in sequence in the comprehension. But yeah, again, like if you put some kind of like five-step comprehension in your production code, everybody will hit you, um, except for uh, other weirdos who, for some reason, adamantly uh, really like this sort of thing. Um, actually, let's see if there's more. Uh, yeah, so uh, back to generators. Um, again, like generators are totally amazing in terms of um, the performance improvements that they uh, allow, instead of just kind of like storing object after object like massive objects in memory uh, that you're kind of like not really um, reaccessing. So uh, when you construct a generator, it's not going to drop the actual values um, like a list would. So you get a generator object, and then you need to travel through it. Uh, so if you see I'm accessing the first object uh, by calling next on the iterable, and it returns 0, um, which is the first even number in, in the range. Um, and if you, uh, if you look at when I call the rest of the object, um, it's going to uh, omit that 0, because uh, the important thing to remember about a generator is that once you travel through it, it empties out. Um, so it's, again, like that's kind of just reaffirming the idea that it's not something that's stored. Um, and it's kind of like an instruction for how to travel through um, an iterable. So once I've called, now you see like I've called the first element. I've called you know, all of the ones that remain. Um, and then when I call that uh, object again, uh, or call list on it, it is empty. Um, so the reason that I'm showing you this is kind of just like it's the half step from um, from a like the traditional kind of like for loop way of doing things to um, to expressions. So now you have lambda functions. Um, you know this is how you would declare functions normally. Um, both of these are kind of like equivalent, where one of them is just doing the comprehension method that we saw before, um, whereas the kind of the um, the lambda way of doing it, what, what a lambda is, is effectively, it is just an anonymous function. It's, it's like a functional expression that you don't um, like define or store anywhere, or ideally, you wouldn't store it anywhere. Um, because the point is to be able to use it as a throwaway. Like You don't want to write a function that you're only going to use once. Um, and, and you want to be able to just like carry through an operation um, really quickly, for example, like sorting a list in a certain way. Um, this, it says, well, definitely don't do, the, do it like this, because um, you, you don't, again, like the, the bottom example should be a defined function. And it should be something that you are like reusing in your code, um, because that's just kind of like a shitty way of mucking up your code base, like making anonymous functions that are actually objects but aren't defined as such. Um, so what's up? Really? Oh, crap. Wow. OK. so. Um, this is kind of like the, um, the way of um, some examples. Uh, 
I'm, can I go over like by two minutes? Uh, sure. Okay, cool. Okay, so yeah, these are just some examples. Uh, we're going to get to them. So um, the bottom one is probably the most important because I don't revisit it where um, you can see that like I'm, I'm trying to um, perform, you know, certain like function operations on, on an iterable. Um, and obviously I don't want to like make a function just for, um, you know, doubling a number if I'm only going to do it once. But what, the one that I really like is if you're sorting data sets, um, the bottom example, for example, you take the, um, the element and uh, it's the, the second element inside, for example, like a tuple, um, and you now sort them according to the values. Okay, so, uh, god, map. Um, map, you're basically taking a function and mapping it onto an iterable, so uh, thanks REST API. Uh, this is like if you've ever worked with JSON data, it's really great that you get numbers and strings, which is kind of like there's a really good reason for it. Um, not every language deals with them in the same way, uh, thanks JavaScript too. Um, so you probably in Python want to transform those into integers. Um, you don't get, again, you don't get the values, you get a map object, which isn't quite a generator, but similar. Um, and by, you know, like if you call list on the object to see what's actually contained in it, um, you can see that that's, that's how that works. So um, next example, for, like you can, um, you can take, um, like this is, this is kind of like a nice way to articulate if you've ever worked with zip. Um, you know that like if two iterables are different sizes, like it'll just do the shortest size. Um, and so this is kind of like the way to make zip using lambda expressions. Um, the actual implementation is like not terribly, terribly different. Um, so now we have a filter, which, um, so map filter reduce are all like ways of using um, lambda expressions, like things, the things that make them worthwhile. Um, so this is kind of like the if condition um, for an iterable or, um, oh my god, or uh, yeah, just like a way to filter out your data um, without, um, without kind of like spamming uh, nested conditions. Um, I'm sure that you can figure out how to um, construct like more um, complicated expressions if you need. And this is kind of like the, just the, the proof of concept for uh, the difference in um, like making the object versus creating the, uh, the lambda function. Um, Okay, so reduce is the, this is the last one. This is really, really cool. Um, basically, you're just taking the sequential pairs in an object. Um, and if you're familiar with like functional languages, it's basically like fold, except you don't get a starting value. Um, so it's effectively an accumulator. In this one, you have like uh, the product of uh, two terms. Um, and like I had a really gory example for a Fibonacci sequence that I left out, but you can kind of imagine like applications where you have like two sequential terms and you constantly need to accumulate the first one and apply it. So uh, yeah, that's all. Um, basically, um, if you're working with uh, data sets and you find that you are um, trying to figure out how to most efficiently perform the transformations on it that you need, like consider um, these uh, like map filter reduce uh, using Lambda expressions and also poke through um, iter tools and func tools a bit more because there's a lot of stuff that's like pre-made um, that are kind of like additional uh, functionalities based on this. So yes, what is it under wrapper? So my working example is Canadian postal codes. So that's the, you know, T5Y blah, blah, blah thing. So I work for a startup that delivers kittens, sorry, that delivers mittens to kittens. And we must ensure that our deliveries are made right, which means we have written, or rather over-engineered a single class to represent Canadian postal codes, right? So here's my class. Uh, if you're asking, Eddie, how, how complicated can a postal code class really be? Uh, maybe ask me during questions. Anyway, so with my postal code, uh, I can ask it what is the forward sortation area. That's the first three digits. I can ask it the local delivery unit. I can ask a postal code if it's rural or urban. I can determine just from the postal code what province it's in. And I've made a nice dunder string method to give me a nice little representation that I could put on a postage uh, on a letter. So let's actually use this class in our code. So if I run this code, this is a list of my deliveries, I expect to see, oh no, what is this angle bracket thing? So maybe you've run into this before, this weird 
angle brackety nonsense, and you're like, what is that? That's not useful to me. Well, that is the default return of Dunder Repr for inherited by all objects. So what is Dunder Repr according to Python's data model document, which, by the way, I think I have that loaded already. It's this wonderful document. You should read it every morning when you wake up. It's a great document. Uh, according to this document, uh, Dunder Repr is called by the Repr built-in function to compute the official string representation of an object. OK, so what does that mean? So say we've got an object that you have defined, and we print the Repr of it. That Repr is going to be, by default, that angle bracket notation. OK, not super useful. Um, however, Python also, you might have encountered the Dunder string method. And when you call print on an object, it implicitly calls Dunder string for you. Uh, as you can see in this example, it gives you the same output as print of string of your object. However, as soon as you put your object into any kind of data structure, a list, a tuple, a dictionary, anything like that, uh, suddenly Python will use the Dunder repr to represent it. So here I put a postal code in a list of just one element. And, oh no, I forgot to run that line of code. There we go. OK. So yeah, it called my Dunder repr method, which is the default, which is that angle, brank, angle bracket nonsense. There we go. And if I do the same thing with a dictionary, I still get that angle bracket stuff. So what is this angle bracket representation stuff useful for? Well, the intended purpose is for you to debug and for you to copy paste code and recreate objects. So it's really useful if you use a uh, professional de debugging software, like whatever is in PyCharm or VS Code. Uh, if you debug using print, that's OK. Repr's got your back. Uh, and of course, whenever you use an interactive console like uh, Google Colab or just Python command line, it's useful there too. You can see the object, and thus you can copy paste it and recreate it. So how is oh whoops? How is uh, this angle bracket thing actually useful for us? Well, as you can probably tell, it's not it's not useful. So again, according to that beautiful document, the Python data model. Uh, Whatever is returned by Dunder Repr should be a string that looks like valid Python code. It should return a string of valid Python code. So how can we make our postal codes, Dunder Repr, actually useful? Well, we start off with actually defining the method in our class. So class postal code, define Dunder Repr, takes in uh, no arguments other than self and it will return some kind of string. What kind of string should repr return? In most cases, the string that recreates the object will just simply be a call to the constructor of that class. So my class is called postal code, so the string that I return is going to be postal code, then open paren, and then whatever arguments the constructor takes, followed by a close paren just literally what you type to instantiate that object. So uh, right here, self.underscore code, that is the internal representation of my class. And that is actually going to be the first argument of the postal code constructor. So the way I've done it right here, I just, at, I just concatenated uh, the postal code open brace and close brace, and then put the variable inside, the uh, attribute inside. If I do it naively like this, I get a return from Dunder Repr that looks like this, right? Does this seem right? No, right? Because when I run it, it's actually a syntax error. So the last tip to write a good Repr method is to call uh, Repr recursively. So my postal code is defined in terms of my attribute called self.underscore code. So in order to actually put that, concatenate that with the constructor, I'll just call repr of that object. So I'm just going to skip ahead here and run the final class. So once you 
do the, done, uh, the wrapper of any of the attributes you have, that returns, in this instance, a string with the quotes. So if I run p equals some postal code and print the wrapper of it, check that out. It's, it's my constructor, right? It's a call to my constructor. And therefore, if I do the same thing I did before and put a list of my deliveries and then print that list, it's going to show me nicely formatted that list with all the constructors to my postal code class. So one last question, how is that different from Dunder string? So think of Dunder string as useful for your end users, right? So you might, uh, you might define Dunder string for Django models because that's visible in the admin panel. However, Dunder wrapper is useful for debugging. You should probably always define a Dunder wrapper for your classes because if there is no Dunder string defined, if you haven't defined a Dunder string, it will default to Dunder wrapper. So that's it. That's all I got. Uh, just some quick tips. Uh, there is, I'm going to skip the first two. Always test your Dunder wrapper by copy pasting your, the return and then putting the tr uh, in the interactive console and making sure it's the same. And also, if you don't feel like writing this method, named tuple and data classes in Python 3.7 will write it for you. OK, that's actually it. That's the end. Thanks. So maybe a little bit of misnomer for the title here, but uh, let me ask you a simple question first. How many people here, uh, what, what libraries do you use to visualize your data from Python? Anyone? Matplot? Yeah, that's the most common one. Um, I'm getting to the end just from the start so that I don't mislead you guys uh, to this. But this is essentially a question of how do I visualize my data from Python? And the problem is I want to represent it in ways that you don't typically see in Python, uh, not with typical graphs and plots. So before I get to it, I, I, there's some context I need to provide so you guys understand what's going on here. Uh, this, this, there's a site available, it's mdp.ai. Feel free to go to it, it's fully working and whatnot. But uh, you, do people here, uh, how many of you underst uh, understand what uh, Markov decision process is? A few people, which makes sense. So think of it this way. It's a representation to try and model the world. And this is for university research, but the long and short of it is I have a coin that's heads. Right? That's heads right now. And I'm going to take the action, and there's a 50% chance it's going to go back to heads, 50% chance it's going to go to tails. That's basically the idea of it. It's just a way to represent chances. If you look at something like grid world or just a maze, and you want to get an algorithm to solve a maze, your mouse to solve a maze, it's the same idea. The mouse at this point can go up, down, up, down, left, right. But essentially, it's at the state of 1, 1. It could take the election, go left, and it'll end up in the state of 0, comma 1, which is this place right here. And the goal with reinforcement learning, or RL, is you want to get the most reward through time, and you want your agent, in this case the mouse, to learn how to solve the maze. Let's say at the end of the maze, this goal, you, get, you give the mouse some cheese, like a reward of 1. Uh, and the way typically you try and solve these RL problems or the simple basic ways is to try and get to the end through all sorts of randomness. But when you get to the end, you kind of leave yourself uh, kind of a breadcrumbs in your own mind to know, OK, you know what? I've gone through all these different states. I kind of know that I should probably approach here. Next time you go here, you kind of, again, leave yourself kind of a uh, trail of breadcrumbs. I know this isn't quite the Python thing yet, but. There you go. Uh, that's that's kind of some context for it. So um, what I did was I wanted to visualize that problem itself in trying to get the data from algorithms. Because I think university researchers aren't going to swap over to using JavaScript to represent their data. So how can we let people use Python and still be able to represent their data in an interesting way? So this is kind of uh, mdp.ai is this thing I've been working on, which allows you to take those Markov decision processes or those graphs and allow you to kind of uh, look at them and visualize them in ways that might help you debug the ability to the, the problem of trying to uh, solve 
a maze or drive a car or whatever you have, right? So, or play poker for that matter. Uh, just as an example, a simple one, this one on the right here is what people call um, random walk. So let's say your mouse starts in state three and then it can take a number of actions and if it goes left, it'll go to state two. If it goes right, it'll go to state four. And the idea is you want to get to the end and you want to know that you should be going in one direction instead of randomly going back and forth. Uh, there's a visual way to solve it, so I'm kind of showing all the probabilities and the pink dots. Anyways, long and short of it is it gets complex and then you get a lot of like colorful values, right? But this is just all in JavaScript. Now, what if I want to actually allow people to uh, use Python to try and solve these Markov decision processes or these worlds. Uh, the short answer is I, I was using Socket.io in, in short to try and uh, get people to be able to do that. Uh, what I eventually uh, I simply do is I run a Socket.io socket code looking for a localhost server on the website and then on the Python side, I essentially have a really simple piece of code which represents the mouse or the agent in this case to say um, I have a bunch of actions I could be taking left down whatever those actions are. I'm just randomly going to take one and then I'm just going to say I'm going to take this action and then throw it back to the environment which is actually on the, on the, uh, on the browser. So wh what I find fascinating about this is you have a website that has problems that researchers on your own local host computers can solve just by going onto the website and they don't have to download anything else. They just have to have this simple line of code and the interfacer itself is right there. It's just two lines. And I wanted to quickly show you guys the actual code of the interfacer too. So it's, uh, like it's not terribly complex. It's a uh, Flask app which uses uh, WSG, WSGI server and then just socket IO code to kind of communicate to the browser. And what that allows me to do is, um, previously this was disconnected, now it's connected because now I'm running the server. If I hit run step here, hopefully this works, then you see the yellow part I should explain is where the mouse or the agent currently is. And it's got different actions it could potentially take and it can choose to go left or right or depending on the problem. So let's keep focus maybe with this one right here where I think in the ideal situation, uh, if I go back here, it wants to go right. You get a reward when you get to all the way to what is state number six here. So you want it to learn to do that. And so you now have a, Python, a piece of Python code that's running. I'm gonna keep running steps. And then what you notice that little red dot right there is the breadcrumbs that I'm now visualizing because in Python it's hard to show that sort of number and so um, and then you can actually do other things like you can look at the amount of rewards you're getting and you can run 50 steps so you essentially if you look at the uh, the console here I'm showing what steps are being taken but that singular class is being applied to solve these three separate problems and it can be used to solve like more, more complex problems like this one on the left where it's not a simple straightforward maze if you want to put it. Uh, so essentially this is just trying to take Python code and allow people to run their own Python code but visualize the data and the outcomes through a web browser. And that's what this is. Okay, so what I'm going to do, this is my first talk at this uh, particular meetup, so I thought I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, do a brief history of uh, Python, so I have a bit of a mashup title, and uh, that bottom actually was the first official logo for Python from the 1990s to 2006, and it was designed by the brother of, uh, who, of the founder of, or the creator of Python, and uh, if, you, if it looks kind of dot matrixy, that's uh, probably because of the error that that uh, particular logo was created. So we'll go back in time. Uh, a long time ago in a faraway Netherlands, there lived a programmer named Guido van Rossum, and uh, his name is not Guido, so I'm going to try not to butcher his name. Um, 
he was born in 1956, so he's about 63 and a half. Uh, he did his, he actually had formal training in, in comp sci and, and mathematics. Uh, he got his uh, degree at the University of Amsterdam in 1982. And he, after that, he wound up working at a research institute, and it was, I think it was called CWI, which in English was uh, for mathematics and uh, computational uh, science. And uh, he worked under several people uh, with a particular programming language, which I'll mention later on. And then later on, in particular, uh, this is where the beginning of Python happened, was in December of 1989. Uh, now, most normal people, when they have a week off for Christmas, will probably do stuff like skiing or stuff like that, and, but not Guido. He decided he'd start a, uh, create a new operating system. He had actually, um, um, at the bottom uh, um, bullet point, he had actually worked for a few years on the ABC programming language, which was developed at, at the uh, CWI Institute in Amsterdam. And uh, he found, he thought of some things that he could do to try to improve that language. And uh, I guess Monty Python's Flying Circus uh, was, uh, he liked that, so that's why he named it Python. And that's apparently according to him. And he had several goals. He wanted it to be open source. He also wanted it to be easy to use, so non-compiled. So he wanted to build an interpreter so that you could type in the code and it would uh, create the machine language in the background dynamically. Uh, and, and, and execute uh, as, as you uh, typed in your code sentences. Um, and he also wanted it to be re easy to read. Um, and and I, that's one of the things I do like about Python is the use of white space and indentations. Uh, if anyone's ever worked with languages like I think C, where you can have you know, a, a gazillion uh, brackets, it can be very hard to, um, to interpret, especially if people don't make use of indentation. The, uh, he actually has a blog. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of a stickler for trying to find source content and, and original source material as opposed to just Wikipedia. And uh, Guido actually does have a, uh, had a blog and uh, that's the link. And I will put the links uh, within the next few days onto the uh, Slack channel for the meetup so that uh, you can have access to them. He, he uh, just like any blog, he had some good intentions. In 2009 and 2010, he put quite a few posts. And so if you want to find history of Python straight from the horse's mouth, this is the blog spot to go to. And then he kind of petered out after that. But I think it's a good source of info. Uh, also, before I continue on there, I also did make use of the release notes, uh, which is uh, what, what they've done is they've actually concatenated uh, all of the release notes uh, for the Python versions into one page. It's, it's a massive page. It, it loads quickly because it's in, in text format, but you'll, you'll know that it's a large page because your button on your scroll bar on the right is going to become very minuscule. Uh, so you need to use the uh, control F function to, to search for stuff on that. But, but I found it to be a very good uh, resource for probably, it's probably about 99% of the release notes are, are on that page. So Python 0.90. It, um, I thought it was maybe like a beta version, but I've never seen any mention of it being referred to as that. Uh, so, and I don't know why he started at, at zero, but uh, the release date, no, okay, so 1989, they, him and, and several people at CWI worked on it internally, and uh, then they released it to what he called an alt source, because I guess they didn't have stuff like GitHub and whatnot back then. So that was the release date to, to the world. And he had things like uh, classes with inheritance because um, at that time um, object-oriented programming was, was sort of becoming a big thing in the early 90s. And use of things like functions and exception handling so that uh, you know, if things went, went, went amiss, it would, you could uh, exit gracefully. The first version, uh, Python 1.00, was released several years later in 1994. And Conveniently, there was a talk earlier on with uh, talking about some of the probably much beloved functions uh, like lambda and map, and I won't bother mentioning those or some of the others because uh, they've already been discussed, but uh, one of the things about uh, open source code is that the spotlight is, it tends to be on the person who's the founder and everyone hears about Huido and there are some unsung heroes and, and apparently early on there was an individual called Emery Prem who um, was a fan of Lisp and uh, missed a number of the functions that you could carry over from Lisp. And he actually did the legwork to get Lambda map, reduce, and several other 
um, um, of the functionality early on into Python. So you can thank uh, Amrit for that, uh, for those things. Python 2.0 uh, came out about six years later in 2000, and uh, they they had garbage collection. Uh, I'm I'm not. I'm actually. We'll mention a few more things in the next slide. Um, this particular release of Python uh, has probably a fairly large uh, code base that, that's currently in production, which will probably cause its own issues in the future as, as uh, per the uh, Python Enhancement Proposal 373, the official support for this version uh, is going to cease as of uh, January of, of 2020 uh, with the last bug fix. Now. Python 3.0, uh, the development started in about 2006 and uh, internally uh, it was referred to as Python 3000 or Py 3K. The uh, actual release date was December 3rd, 2008 and uh, for anyone who's, pro who's been using Python as of, as of late, um, that's probably the, the version that's being, being used. Um, now I'm not going to uh, go into much detail about these uh, because it's a lightning talk, but also because it'll give me an excuse to have another talk at a future date. So I did already talk with Dan about uh, <laughs> doing a Python 2 versus 3 uh, at the September Python meetup, and uh, that's a dot matrix error emoji at the end there. Uh, Python rankings. Now, Python is one of the world's most popular programming languages. Uh, and I don't want to disappoint you, it's not the most popular, uh, but <laughs> it was um, the third most popular primary language on GitHub. So when people put projects into the GitHub repository, you have a primary language and then you'll have whatever secondary languages that are being used. Uh, there, there is uh, the um, GitHub, which is their, the Octoverse, uh, they, they, they have a blog and uh, they, they give an update typically once a year about programming languages. And, They've, they've sliced and diced the data in a number of ways, and what I've done is I've chosen two uh, to present to you here. And uh, so that was my source. Now, the first one is the global rank. There was a top 10. I didn't want this to be crowded. I wanted it to be fairly straightforward. Plus, Python was right near the top. You'll notice over the past uh, five years, uh, JavaScript and Java were in the number one and two positions globally. Python was in the number four, but it crossed over in 2015 to the number three position. The um, PHP went down a notch, which isn't a surprise because PHP kind of had its glory days, you know, about, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, well, 1990s and, and early 2000s, and, and uh, that language is being sort of, people are moving over into things like JavaScript uh, for that. Now, what is interesting, I, I did pull over one other chart, and... Uh, the number three position might be global, but the number two position is actually within North America. So if you look at the blue line, you'll notice that in North America, Python last year was actually the number two position after JavaScript, and, uh, and Java was in the number three position. So North America seems to be biased towards uh, Python uh, usage, and, and maybe it's because there was probably you know, early adoption in places like Silicon Valley, and from there, you know, you get your thought leaders and it spreads out from there. And if you're wondering what number four is, because again, I cut this off, there's actually a 10 ranking here. Uh, that's C++. And that is it. Um, so, <laughs> it was a lightning talk. <laughs> right on. And... <laughs> so, was, how many minutes was that? <laughs> I think I started late, but you know what? Uh, I actually get to bend time, and it was an even five minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah, there so. you go. Now, I left this up as the last slide, and what I was going to just say is all, I, all of the links that I put in, I will get them onto, the, onto our Slack channel. Uh, and so in the spirit of under-promising and over-delivering, I won't promise that I'll get it there tonight, but in the next two days or so. So if you check it in by the weekend, the link should be up. Uh, right. So... Uh, so we're going to have Rita uh, talk to us about her text-based game. Uh, so please help me give a warm welcome to Rita. Okay, thank you so much. All right, 
I'm going to talk today about a passion project of mine, which is called IntFicPy. IntFicPy is a Python game engine for creating interactive fiction. Interactive fiction is a type of game where the story is told primarily through text. IntFicPy is parser-based, which means the player interacts by typing natural language commands. I decided to build IntFicPy because the two major systems for creating this type of game, TADS and Inform, each require learning a specialized programming language with no other uses. IntFicPy games, on the other hand, are programmed in ordinary Python with some special functions and classes. Parsing natural language commands can be uh, challenging. Um, for interactive fiction, the problem is greatly simplified by the conventions of the genre, which mean that valid commands are always going to be simple sentences in imperative tense, like direct orders. So take lamp, dig with shovel, or put ball in box type of things. When parsing a command, int ficpy begins by looking up the first word in the dictionary of verbs. Then it uses clues such as prepositions, on, in, up, etc., and number of grammatical objects to differentiate between similar verbs and different word orders for the same verb. Then, once that's done, it finds the items for the grammatical objects and calls the correct verb function. Verbs in IntFicPy are instances of the verb class, with properties containing primarily grammatical information. Each verb has a verb func method called when the verb is used. A verb may also have methods for getting objects implicitly. implicitly. For instance, ask about dog uh, might have IntFicPy assume you mean ask Sarah about dog if the last person you talked to was Sarah, or if Sarah is the only person nearby. IntFicPy currently has 78 built-in verbs, including all the standards of the genre. Game creators can also create new verbs in minutes, and these will integrate seamlessly with the predefined verbs. IntFicPy has 28 classes for items, all subclasses of thing. Different item classes can be interacted with in different ways. For instance, the player can look through an object of the class transparent, can read a readable, can unlock a lock with the correct key. The add composite method can be used to create composite items such as a dresser with a surface on top and three drawers that open and close. Non-player characters in IntFicPy are created using the actor class. Actors by default can't be taken, can't be bought and sold, but most importantly players can talk to them. Conversations are built of topics and special topics. Topics are the classic interactive fiction, ask X about Y, tell X about Y, show Y to X, or give Y to X. The player can ask or tell the actor about any item they know about, that is, any item the player has seen, or any item that the game creator has manually added to the player's knows about property. Special topics are suggested to the player during conversation. The player can type out the suggestion or part of the suggestion to select the topic, and this allows for more complicated conversations. In FicPy, I've been working on it for about seven months now, and it's finally really coming together. I'm testing it right now, and also I'm developing the first fully featured game for IntFicPy, which will be released in the 29 competition, 2019 competition IF comp. Uh, if you're interested in IntFicPy, if you want to use it, if you want to help me test it, please come talk to me. Um, also, I am looking for work at the moment, so, yep. Okay, uh, thanks, that's it, unless we have time for a little demo. Okay. Okay, let's see if I can see up there. Uh, so, those should fit to the screen, the next ones. Um, yeah. So, I guess we're inside the shack. Um, we can greet the person there. Oh, apparently not. Got a glitch. Mm -hmm. Two eyes. Is there a person in there? 
Oh. Yeah, just the middle. Okay. So we got the response there, and you see a special topic suggested at the bottom. So we could type out the full ask how you got here, or just ask. And then she'll tell us. Um, we can go upstairs. Um, we could take the key, or we could take all. Look under bed. Oh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, and then you can unlock it and stuff. And so there's a whole world to explore. But uh, yeah, that's, that's just an example of the sort of thing you could build. And over here, um, on the other side, is a little bit of what the code looks like. I don't know how good example that is. But if you can see that stuff, um, like it's pretty simple to do something like um, create a new room. Um, I wish I could see that well enough to scroll around. It's just instantiating a class, right? Um, with a couple. Yeah, so. Thanks, guys.